Good afternoon, or it's almost lunchtime. That's not, never an easy place to be, but uh, thank you very much for hanging in there. Um, and I would like to open the next panel um, about the future of sustainability in the watch and jewelry industry, but really focusing on biodiversity and nature. And we have some uh, quite uh, prominent speakers online. Uh, Nora Yams here, the CEO of Danat. Uh, we have um, Liesl Trusta, who is the director of the Biodiversity Consultancy. We have Madeleine here, our nature strategy expert. We have Francesca here from Caring. And we also have online uh, Matan uh, Tsabari, the CSR manager of Taché Diamonds. And I must say, when I joined the initiative uh, 15 months ago as executive director, I think one of the most biggest learning curves for me has been working with the brands on nature, biodiversity, and climate. And I realized, yes, our industry has been really focusing on the S side, but we need to understand very much, Lisa, like you said, the interconnectivity and how we need to manage. And I just want to see that the panelists are online, so let me just try the technicalities here. Can we check? Hi. Hi, Liesl. <laughs> Hi. Thank you Good so much start. for joining in. We thought it was important for the industry to kind of set the scene. And I don't think there's a better expert than Liesl and Madeline to kind of give you a flavor. But, you know, what does uh, biodiversity mean? And what does biodiversity mean for the watch and jewelry industry? And, uh, and maybe sharing some concrete examples. So, Liesl, I'm going to give you the floor. And I also want to applaud her and the team because it has been a fabulous learning journey for me and I think for many of our members uh, coming on board on the nature and climate uh, uh, journey. So thank you, Liesl. Thank you, Harris. It's, a, it's an absolute pleasure to be here, at least virtually. Um, I appreciate the, the opportunity. And of course, Madeline is, is there with you in person and she says it's an amazing fair. So very jealous of everybody that's, that's there together. Just checking you can hear me okay. Perfect. Okay, great. So yes, uh, great question. Always a good one to start with. What is biodiversity in the first place? Um, in a nutshell, it refers to all the life on Earth. So it's the living component of nature. Nature and biodiversity are often used interchangeably, of, of course. Um, but if you think about biodiversity as the variation and the abundance of life on Earth and nature as the, this living part, but also what we call the so-called, the, the, the non-living part um, of, of the world, and that's the atmosphere, our climate, the geology, water. So together that makes up nature. And one important point, and I heard it raised in the, in the panel earlier, um, and I caught the tail end of, and we have to keep reminding ourselves about the interconnectivity between biodiversity and nature, and obviously our, our climate. Um, they're all connected. This web of life provides the ecosystem services and keeps us within a, a regulated planetary safe place to, to live and, and operate and, and, and have um, the well-being that we, we depend upon. Um, and when we disrupt one part of it too far, there naturally has consequences for others. And we're seeing this in, in many ways, um, particularly most recently, um, with climate change and increased temperatures and the number of forest fires. Um, and of course, this has devastating effect on nature. So showing that interconnectivity of, um, of the crises. And the other thing we've got to keep in mind is that we as humans are part of this web of life. We're part of nature. Um, we, we might think ourselves to be very clever and a little bit different, um, but actually we're as dependent on uh, our home being a safe place to live and not being degraded as, as any other species. And Iris, I'll briefly mention a couple of statistics just because they are a sobering reminder and I know drive some of the work of the WJI and, and society generally. 
And that biodiversity is declining faster than at any other time in human history, um, which is quite sobering. And since 1970, so longer than long, as long as I've been alive, there's been an average of almost 70% decline, that's 70% decline in the populations of mammals, birds, fish, reptiles and amphibians. So this is an important time. Um, we, have the, we have this insight, we have this data, and so we have that huge responsibility that you've referred to, Iris, to do something about it. So very quickly, I'll talk about, I've got two sets of five um, to talk about um, that answers the second part of your question about you know, what, what, are the, what are some of the impacts of our industry and what can we do about it? So the first set of five are the pressures that we have on this planet. And this applies to all industries, all supply chains, not just watches and jewelries. Um, and, and yeah, the impact that we have on land use and land use change. So this is the deforestation, conversion of natural habitats, natural grasslands, wetlands, that sort of thing. Um, and although there's impact at all stages of supply chains, watch and jewellery included, uh, the biggest impact for most, and once again, it, it, for watch and jewellery, is the raw material production right at the base of supply chain. This is where the mining or the farming of cattle for leather um, is, is where... Um, some of the biggest impact on land use change is happening. The other, the second area, pressure, is the over-exploitation of natural resources and endangered species. So this is where we've got to think about the skins and the hides and the components such as that and where they might be coming from um, and if they're connected to um, rare or endangered species. The third is climate change. We've talked about this um, many in many ways, probably already today in your sessions, but that comes back to the fossil energy use and the emissions that are being produced. Uh, the fourth is pollution. So this is where the, the chemical applications, the once again, the waste and emissions that are coming from uh, production, that's a big pressure on nature. And finally, invasive species, once again, um, we go back to where land is being disrupted or changed or degraded in some way, which allows um, introduced species to maybe take over and have it and, and take the space of the um, indigenous species. So those are the five pressure points that are a key to our industry addressing. And then a positive note, I'm going to just very briefly mention five action areas. Uh, that uh, we're looking at at the WJI and, and beyond, and they ladder up things like the science-based targets for nature. And that's the AR3T framework, the avoid, reduce, regenerate, and restore and transform. Um, avoid, briefly, is connected to innovative materials. It's moving from, well, do we really need to source this material in the first place? Um, are there alternatives? There's a lot of innovation in this space. Um, the circular economy is driving us as an industry looking at what's in our waste that is probably not waste and can be converted back into secondary materials rather than using the primary ones. Reduce, um, we need to look at sustainability standards and certifications to see how we can minimise impact through criteria that sit within a lot of these standards. Restore and regenerate is a really exciting place for the WJI to be looking at um, where ecosystems could benefit from restorative uh, practices that can uh, create more, you know, not just reduce and reduce harm, but actually do, do good. So that's an exciting part. And finally, I'll leave you on transform, which is what the WJI and all of us are here talking about today. How do we take an industry on that journey and transition to a nature positive carbon net zero world? So long answer, um, Iris, but I hope that um, gave some good foundations for why we're, we're talking about nature today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Liesl, and also thank you for joining online. And let me now go to Nora, who is the chair of the Biodiversity Committee for WGI 2030. I think for people that do not know our governance, I invite you to go to our website. We've put quite an investment in on the whole governance framework from an independent risk and compliance committee to multi-stakeholder. But every pillar also has a chair. And uh, so for climate resilience, for biodiversity, and for uh, inclusiveness. And we're very honored to have Nora, the CEO of Danat, 
Danat also leading the way on many topics of biodiversity as our chair. And I thought it'd be nice, um, Nora, to kind of give you, give a, a bit of the flavor, you know, what is it to chair this group really? And what are your first impressions on bringing everyone on this journey of nature? Because I am honestly probably the one with no knowledge on this topic. I've struggled, uh, but uh, up to you to talk about it. Uh, good afternoon and good morning to everyone at Vicenza. It's an honor to be here with you today, even virtually. Um, uh, I had the opportunity to discuss this topic briefly yesterday um, with Liesl, and we were talking about, um, you know, why nature? And um, I come from a part of the world where now sustainability is the hot topic. COP28 uh, was just hosted in Dubai and everyone is talking about sustainability. And banks today have best practices, have developed systems to talk about sustainability, oil and gas and so on. But you know what? The one topic that no one is addressing is nature. Everyone is doing something about sustainability, but there are no measures about nature. And I think this is what makes WJI unique is that it's not only about sustainability, it's also about the impact on nature. It's not only about the product and, um, and sustainability of the product, but it's also about where the product is coming from, what is the product leaving behind. And then the third pillar of the WJI is diversity and inclusiveness. It's about the people. You know, we deal with, with, uh, with the WJI we, we deal with, with luxury materials. So no one is buying luxury materials because they're essential, they're water or they're food. We're, everyone, the consumers are buying luxury products because of the uh, intangible promises that the products bring forth. It's about the commitment. Uh, you know, one time it's about the source, where the product is coming from. You know, it, it, 10 years ago, it was, about, was it coming from a conflict, a free zone or not? Um, uh, and today it's about, uh, you know, sustainability. Tomorrow's generation is not going to be talking only about sustainability. The new generation today are educated about nature, about the impact of nature. They're studying about, just like Liesl said, about biodiversity, about the impact of even microbes. And what are we doing to, doing to impact the, the um, microbiomes, even in our systems? So... I, I see the second pillar of the WGI is the insurance policy that will ensure that the industry stays relevant to consumers 10 years from today. This is not something to address today's population. It's something, or today's consumer, this is something to address the consumers that are going to be entering uh, the demand and buying these products 10 years from today. So I think it's really essential. It's an essential element, and it gives me great pleasure to be he here with everyone today. Thanks, Nora. And maybe you can give also some comfort to companies because you know, talk a little bit about the maturity journey, or maybe, I think, maybe Liesl, you can uh, support Nora because we're all on this journey, and then we've got some great leaders like Caring here next to me, uh, Cartier, Chanel, I mean, we can name them. And then we see that SMEs are stepping, which is fantastic. Suppliers communities are stepping in. And I applaud them because they have the courage to start this journey. And they're doing already a lot of good. So maybe, Liesl, can you talk a little bit about the philosophy, how you're handling this together with Nora? I don't know who wants to step in first. I think it's interesting maybe for people who do not know the approach. Yeah, shall I? I can say a little, a little bit and pass it over to you, Nora. Sure. Um, sure. Yeah, I mean, it's been fascinating for me. I come from more of the sort of the fashion supply chain side, and there's obviously some some similarities and also some differences. But the community that the WJI is creating, as Nora was saying, around um, sort of stepping up, looking at, okay, we've got some learning to do. There are some gaps. How do we go on this journey together? What's the pre-competitive space we can create? And what's the fast tracking we can do as a group to get to a, a to build capacity to take everyone on the journey? And, and Iris, you, you mentioned some of the the more advanced, the more mature companies. They are they're beacons. It's not a competition. It's really about what we can learn and share and and build the build this the confidence within the community. So we do applaud the beacons. Um, and then we also look at the, 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 
the fast tracking, and, and Matan might talk a little bit about this. We discussed this the other day as well. That once you've built a, a kind of foundation of, of knowledge, and I and I do put confidence in that as well. I mean, of course, there's always going to be more to learn. Always, um, but if we get to a point where there's a level of confidence. Ah, this is what nature and biodiversity means to me, to us as an organisation. Ah, what what can we do? What's the best line of attack or? Um, focus we can have, whether we're a small boutique or a large group of, of masons or a, you know, in the, in the midstream supplier, what's the best move I can make as a company and within this community? So that's what I've really learned, I think, as much as hopefully, you know, we're contributing to as well is, is that shared peer learning learning journey and the fast tracking we will be able to to do together with that attitude and approach. Uh, Lisa, I'd like to go to Madeline now because I think it's important. Sometimes, we, you know, you also have to be very humble and learn if something is not working. And actually something that I saw quite quickly when we started this group was that certain companies were really struggling. And it's not a criticism. I was struggling myself to understand many of the content being presented to me. Um, so we kind of realized we have to do a total different approach to get everyone on board. And I think it would be great, uh, Liesl, just very briefly to talk a little bit about the methodology of the nature primer we developed, the learning journey, and then the help desk support to the members. And then I would like to uh, go to Matan to, to, to really hear from him, you know, how he's learning through that. And then I want to come back to caring. So um, it would be lovely to uh, hear your perspective, Madeline. Yeah, fantastic. So as everyone's kind of already said that, you know, a lot of the members, they're at different parts of their journey. You know, we do have the leaders, we do have some that are just getting started. And so as part of some of the context of what uh, I was just mentioned in the sense of the primer, um, you know, we really, one of the big steps is building that awareness um, just in nature, what is biodiversity, building up that nature agenda. Um, you know, if we can get that foundational piece of, and people can really try to grasp and understand, it really makes it easier for us to kind of all be aligned and start moving forward together as a collective that would lead to that transformative change that we're looking for. Um, so that was kind of the concept of the primer and kind of just start you know, dipping our toes in there, starting to get awareness around those common words, um, making sure we're all on the same page. And so then it's kind of developed also uh, along with this is kind of our learning journey. So we really believe that um, you know, peer-to-peer -peer learning is a fantastic way to build knowledge, gain practical experience, um, and, you know, we're all in this together, so why don't we learn from each other? Because it does help speed up progress. It helps us overcome those roadblocks, identify those gaps, look at those challenges that we're facing. And so as part of the learning journey, you know, having different webinars, different talking sessions, trying to really interact. Um, I mean, I've been having a lot of different conversations with different members just in the last few weeks about, you know, what they're doing within their business or where are they even starting? Um, because I think it can be overwhelming, um, but we also want to remind everyone that um, you know you don't need to have the perfect data, you don't need to have a perfect solution or a perfect methodology. Um, we just know that we need to start now, and we can't wait. And you know, as simple as just setting no regret actions. Um, so again, that kind of is what. The idea is that we really want to kind of build that mindset up, build, give that confidence, and really help the members start making some actions and progress forward. Um, I don't know if Liesl would like to add anything as well to that or Iris. I, I think I might go to Matan because yeah, I really, I, I applaud you as being our nature ambassador now, right, Matan? You're um, our nature ambassador now. Because yeah, he was, the, yeah, so that. maybe you can tell a little bit because it was actually a complete new. Um, uh, chapter for Taché. Yes, you had done some work on it, but now you're really like strategically integrating it. Could you maybe talk a little bit about your learning journey? Yes, of course. Well, first of all, thank you, Iris, for having me as part of this panel. Um, so we're a family-owned multinational diamond company in the midstream supply chain, and um, our core clients are uh, those in the watch and jewelry industry. Um, I would uh, sort of take it into two parts. Uh, on the one hand, you know, what kind of steps that we've taken until now. And the second one would be 
what kind of support we're receiving, which for me is uh, the most important part of the discussion. So the concrete steps that we've taken, and, and we're very new into it, is that uh, you know we've acknowledged that biodiversity is a standalone topic, and uh, we've integrated it into our roadmap for this year. We've allocated a budget, but more to really understand our potential impact areas and not to you know, go as deep as uh, other pillars. Um, I would say that, um, you know, when it comes to uh, having spoken to the board or the entities uh, that are encompassed, we are intentionally not taking our own steps to discover the depth of this topic on our own. And instead, we've uh, taken a decision that uh, at these beginning stages, uh, it's, it's much more important to be guided by the Watch and Jewelry Initiative, and, and I'll expand on the reasoning behind it. Um, so, <clears throat> for me, I mean, I think the easiest way to, to understand the reasoning is to compare it to the other two pillars, in which case, you know, uh, building climate resilience and fostering inclusiveness, they already have existing frameworks, a lot of member companies are a lot more advanced. Um, and so biodiversity is still not a topic that has uh, been completely adopted throughout the supply chain. And so the support here is really crucial. And, you know, one of the highlighting uh, points for me when I think about it is that all the materials that we use are very different. So it's a really good starting point to understand what kind of support we we get so the first one would be and this one is much less tangible but it's extremely important and that's you know to build the confidence of the members that are at the beginning st stages and uh, you know we are and, and i love how open the dialogue is because you know we are part of the 82 percent of companies that are at the very beginning stages and I could say that uh, I've never been more comfortable in not knowing enough in, in this topic. And, and that's really thanks to, to Iris, you and your team and the leadership and the atmosphere that, that gets created around uh, uh, the dialogue that we have. The second uh, part of support that's really important is a bit more uh, tangible, is that you know the Watch and Jewelry Initiative uh, is able to narrow down the focus points for the members that are at the early stages. So, for example, when it comes to you know, uh, OECD due diligence on supply chains, we know that there are resources and maps that can indicate where are the, the high-risk areas and so on. Um, but in biodiversity, depending on the material itself, it's, uh, it's not as obvious. So... You know, the ability for, for the initiative to consolidate information and resources for us to use as a starting point really lays uh, a good foundation for us uh, to, to understand where our focal points would be in our supply chain. Um, uh, another tangible uh, aspect is, is to make sense of the frameworks. I mean, the frameworks do exist, but they are not as integrated as... Uh, or adopted as other frameworks uh, like um, uh, the science-based target initiative. Um, so, you know, in my opinion, um, you know, the value of the Watch and Jewelry Initiative in this topic is it's so important because it's important for us not to overshoot at the beginning stages, you know, the same way that it's important to be comfortable to to know what's your carbon footprint before you decide to commit to net zero targets. Um, and so, you know, with biodiversity in particular, and, and this is really how I feel, but the, the beauty about being a part of the initiative and having such open dialogue about the challenges and the, and the ambitions, it, it gives me a, a sense of excitement to know that we'll be creating a level field of information or templates or you know expectations, data collection points, ambitions that will really be standardized um, 
in a sense, between the members. Of course, it's, it's an approach that's been a, applied to other pillars, but the beauty and the irony behind it is that, you know, despite most companies being the newest to this topic, it gives us the opportunity for, for this pillar to be the most cohesive uh, yeah. in its approach. Th thank you, Mato. And I think it's also encouraging because, you know, sometimes people say, I'm, I'm a player starting, you know, how can I advance? And I think it brings me back to you, Francesca, because, of course, caring has been very advanced in many, many uh, domains. I think the beauty is, I think the, what, what you share as caring, I find it incredible. They have all these experts. Uh, they, they give time. They give capacity. They teach us. They bring this to the table. Um, yeah, I would love to kind of hear also from you, you know, what are some steps that indeed Caring is also taking on this nature journey because you're already ahead of the game and we will follow and learn um, and what that brings to the initiative. And thank you again for being here, Francesca, and being an ambas a good ambassador for us. Thank you, Iris. Uh, it's always a pleasure working uh, for, let's say, first... Uh, for the Watches and Jewelry Initiative, because I see how this initiative is helping the others and advancing the others in specific topics like climate change, biodiversity, and inclusiveness, which is not uh, as said before, it's a journey. And uh, when it comes to uh, biodiversity, Caring started uh, uh, 12 years ago uh, by developing its environmental profit and loss account, which helps uh, the group understand where its environmental impact is, of course, in the supply chain, from the sourcing of raw materials till the stores. And uh, how does it work? It works with uh, life cycle assessment that probably you learn about LCAs and paired with the volumes we buy. And in this way, we are able to understand where our impact is in terms, for example, of water, land, water pollution, air pollution, etc. And this helps us to prioritize on the actions we have to put in place to reduce our impact in nature. And before, I've, um, I've learned from our uh, estimate panelists that uh, um, the question, what nature is, I think that to simplify, we can say that we are all nature because we belong all to one ecosystem. So by respecting nature, we respect ourselves. I think this is the message we have to convey to all the audience here with us today. And something is measuring our impact, but then you have to ask yourself and you have to act by creating your biodiversity strategy. And we created our biodiversity strategy following the four stages of conservation hierarchy, which are avoid, reduce, restore and regenerate, and the last one is transform. So all the, the four pillars are so important in the fashion industry, the jewelry industry, and in all the industries, because those are the principles that we can apply everywhere. And what is important is to always understand that what we do with the resources we source from the, from the planet are back to us. So it's important to have a strategy and to set clear target in order to arrive at a certain point where we can say, okay, we measured, we set our target, we reached the target thanks to our strategy. Yeah, and I think interesting to know is Caring is also uh, piloting the SBTN framework, so we can learn a lot about these new frameworks. We've seen that on SBTI with climate, you know, new targets are set, so it, it sometimes becomes very complicated for companies to maneuver in and understand. So we hope to, to, to learn from that. Just as a, as a, con as a I, I think, a brief conclusion, I'd like to go back to Nora as chair, because Nora, I think probably you have the most challenging role in the initiative, you know, bringing all that work together and also getting us to advance. What are some of those next steps on the table? And maybe, uh, Madeline, you can step in here. Hi, Iris. <laughs> okay. Um, so it's definitely, I mean, I think like my, um, everyone has, ha has pointed out, yes, the nature journey, uh, we are starting, 82% of the respondents did say that they are early in the nature journey, but I think we're fortunate enough that we have industry leaders and beacons uh, such as Caring Group and Cartier to guide, and I think this is what, this is what gives us comfort. 
is that uh, there is a way, you know, we all need to start somewhere. And I, and I think as someone, you know, there are some that are ahead of the curve and uh, we are in the process of setting up the framework to help the, you know, the 82% that are, uh, that are starting their journey on their way, on their way forward. I think the most, the critical thing that I would like to say is that climate resilience by itself is not going to lead to net zero. We have to integrate the element of nature and biodiversity. And this is why this is essential. Um, it is, you know, we are going into into the unknown and territorial waters, but we have leaders and, and what the beauty about it is that the whole industry is coming in together to work on this. Not only um, uh, we have the leaders, but also industry initiatives, you know, uh, with WGI, uh, there is the Sib, there is Sibjo, and there are other industry organizations as well. And this is what gives us the comfort. We're not, you know, hopefully, you know, w within a year's time or within a short period of time, we're all going to be moving forward together. Thank you, Nora. And maybe it's good to say, yeah, we have Sibjo here at the heart of education and training. You know, together we are uh, launching our solutions lab. Uh, with the Global Compact, which will be open for SMEs, which is actually a fantastic, I think, introduction to all these topics in a few languages also, to just bring everyone at least on the awareness journey. And, let, and I just want to also reiterate, we're humble. It's not like we say that we have the solution for the industry. No, we're starting this journey and we are reaching out to anyone who wants to join us and step in. And I look at Tiffany Stevens, the CEO of GVC. I look at uh, Sakira from LBMA. I think it is super important to work together. So um, Madel uh, Madeline, maybe you can just give a very crisp overview what the next steps are and maybe also tell uh, the audience about how I ask accountability to our members. <laughs> sure, sure, I'm very happy to. So, um, you know, one of the things that we're currently developing is coming out will be a nature positive roadmap and that's really gonna be meant for members to start following and leading up to the commitment that we've set with WJI uh, and so that they can start identifying, developing their own uh, roadmap within their business, but it still is aligned uh, altogether, so we're progressing forward. And this also will ladder up to the sustainable development goals, the global biodiversity framework, you know, a lot of the different things that have been in discussion around nature and biodiversity. Um, so, and then that will really build on, you know, the steps you can take, the progress you can make, um, and combining it with case studies. We really want to build off of these practical examples so that companies can understand and start to envision what it might look like for them. Um, and having, and then this will also be interconnected with, you know, our, our learning journey, as I kind of mentioned before, so that we can start bringing in as companies progress forward and they come up with new innovative ideas or they find, okay, like, look, this isn't working for us. How can we start to make some changes to make it work for our business? And so kind of really building on those um, knowledge and sharing. And so that will kind of progress us forward. Um, and then I guess in the terms of just uh, making track and progress and everything, it's also kind of creating those goalposts. Um, so we're going to be having, you know, different, um, working with ESG book and everything and developing out kind of these surveys to kind of monitor the progress as the brands move forward and really kind of identifying, you know, okay, if they're moving forward, fantastic. Why aren't they moving forward? You know, why? Clearly there's a road back here, so let's try to identify what that is so that we can really start to, you know, help them achieve the next steps and move along that roadmap and meet the next goalpost and collectively keep moving forward. And ideally we can then take everything that we learn and start sharing it across with the wider industry and across sectors as well, creating that transformative change. Yeah, and I think from my side, I definitely want to say we want to be humble and learn. And if there are things not working, we will also communicate about it. Because I think it's not only about the successes. I think it's also about, is it failure? No, I think it's learning. It's a new domain. It's very new for our industry. How can we just continue to step uh, forward? And I think one element that is very important is disclosure. We talked about about transparency, that everything that we're shaping with experts is also aligned with regulations that are happening now, but are also coming into the future. So I must say we're working with great policy experts on that because we believe it's critical. Whatever solution we, we, we build cannot be a solution just because of WGI 2030. No, we want to be an, an enabler. We want to be an accelerator. We want to encourage you to action. But also we want you to be you know, moving 
into the compliance space, which is actually a struggle for many of us today. So um, I think that's a bit in a nutshell. Allow me to, to thank my panelists, but I do hope there might be some questions from the audience bef you know, before we conclude. Okay, there's a question. Let me... Would you be so kind to introduce yourself yeah. also? <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. I'm Michela Ferraro. I'm a senior lecturer in jury management and an advisor. I actually I don't have a question. I have a praise. What I just learned is exactly what we would um, like to hear, sharing the um, successes and also the problems. It will help also the trust on our industry. If we are what you just said, Aries, if we are just pretending that we are sustainable and responsible and claiming things that are not totally true, we are losing the trust of our consumers and the trust in our industry. And we, I really uh, liked what I just heard. We need to share everything. We need to be transparent. And it's the only way to keep the trust on our sector. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you, uh, Edward Johnson from the Gemfields Group, mining business and a jewellery retailer. Uh, I want to just highlight something from our perspective as a miner of coloured gemstones in, in Africa and specifically on our concession in Mozambique. To put it in context, our concession is about three times the size of Paris. Um, we face a specific challenge, which I just wanted to bring, you know, there's lots of discussions and this is so important and, you know, our engagement with all the brands has increased and they've come to us now for so much data and talk about biodiversity and we welcome that because that's the journey we live every day in Africa. But I just want to paint a picture for you. Um, the area where we operate in northern Mozambique is, is, is volatile, let me use that word. Um, Economically, it's challenged. We're the largest taxpayer in the whole in the northern province, and we're a relatively small um, mining business. Uh, poverty is rife. Malnutrition is rife. When we do our biodiversity reports, we find that what happens is there's a substantial reduction year on year on basically anything that they can eat. And this is against our biodiversity goals. We're, we're wanting to see an increase in the small and large mammals that are on our concession. Again, remember the size, it's a considerable area. But of course, poverty, uh, you know, people need to eat. And so we have this, this challenge where we need to allow people onto our concession to hunt, to feed their families. And we have to be very careful with that. Malnutrition is critical, but it's reducing our biodiversity stats when we report them through to our stakeholders. And I, I just wanted to paint that picture for you. It's a dilemma. Uh, Ed, I think there are many dilemmas. And I think you touch upon one. I, I think probably we can talk about hundreds of dilemmas. Um, I think one of the things I'm learning through working with all these companies in different parts of the value chain is you could be indeed working on a certain topic positively, but through working on that positively in that topic isolated, you're negative in another topic. So there's a lot of interconnectivity and there's not enough data, like scientific data, to prove some of these points. But of course, when you look at the baseline of humanity is decent labor, access to health, access to education. We talk about the fundamental human rights. We talk about dignity. Um, so then we talk about, you know, what are the priorities in a certain region? Um, then we talk about whose role is it, right? Is the government's role to give this access to these services? And if the government doesn't have those, you know, is it the private business that will step up? Uh, and I know that it's a, a topic that you deeply care about. Um, um, what, and that's where I think we're working with experts to kind of look at that landscape view, because you need to have a landscape view on, on sustainability. And you need to understand then where are some of the material priorities and relevant topics. And you know, we could go on because I think we've been working very much in that third pillar, not thinking disconnected. So we've been really under the leadership of Dr. Nawal Ait Hossein, been looking at, okay, if we look at certain regions, for example, artisanal scale mining, you know, what does that mean? 
on the element of climate, on the element of nature, and what would it mean if we would really build a transformative partnership there? Actually, we need to look at the three components, and this is complex, and this is trial and error. We're thinking about it, we are having good engagement, discussions, and dialogue, but then it will be about doing it. But I applaud what you say, because it's the reality on the ground, um, and I don't know, maybe Liesel, if you want to still give a final comment on that, on what Ed says, because this is, yeah, this is something that we will need to touch as an industry, and all industries have that. Uh, Iris, I think you, your answer was, was right on um, these are complex, interconnective issues that are not going to go away as climate change increases um, and, yeah, poverty potentially increases and the impact on, on nature is, is a consequence as well. So I think we're, the burden, but also maybe the, the blessing, is that we can see these on interconnectivities now and work together to find solutions. I mean, you painted it very well, yeah, it was it, um, in areas that, that these are interconnected challenges and, and maybe, as Eris said, by pulling on one lever, we could either have a detrimental effect in another place or potentially a positive effect. And if as a community, you know, we're, we're looking at more resilience within our supply chains, which is what essentially is is part of the, the picture, is how we can be around as, as, a, as an industry in, in, for generations to come, and Nora, we talked about this a bit yesterday, you know, that's very much part of the solution. And then, Iris, as you say, how that, how, how land, how, sorry, how livelihoods are mm -hmm. impacted and where the other opportunities are, you know, it's, it's not an overnight solution, but, you know, looking at this transition that we're, we're on, we're in, an, indus we're in a, an energy transition, you know, we, ha we have to move away from fossil fuels, we have to move into renewables, and it's sort of the same with, with land-based materials. We, we still need the commodities they're producing, but we need the resilience, and how do we value that differently, and, and what opportunities are there within that different way of valuing the, if you like, the the outputs of a, a landscape, that's visionary yeah. thinking and as much as yeah. it's, it's not going to happen overnight, but there's potential there for, you know, stewards of, of the land and local communities to be valued differently and rewarded and incentivized differently than, than maybe we are now. Um, but, yeah, thanks for the, the yeah. comment. I think that's really helpful. Yeah, and I think as a final thought, Ed, I think it'll be really interesting, you know, when you look at a certain region that you've, you actually have the whole multi-stakeholder ecosystem and understand what's going on. So you, you have to sit with the governments, you'll have to sit with the civil society, you'll have to sit, you know, with the small-scale miners, with, you know, with the owners, with everyone to, to, to look at this topic, and with scientists, right? Because there's so much data that's not even comparable of understandable. So it's a huge opportunity also as an industry to contribute. Uh, not an easy cookie to crack, but like all industries, uh, I, I don't think an excuse not to act. And I think maybe one final topic that I did want to also t tell for the industry is, you know, the topic of living index wage and decent labor. We will have to think about the value chain and bringing decent wages in subcontracting. Um, and, you know, we often see that this happens in the direct operations, tier two, tier three, but if you really go deep, deep, deep into the supply chain, what are the circumstances, how these people live? Do these children have access to education, access to health, and all the fundamental services? So I think there's a lot of work to do, and again, then you need data to understand your value chain. So lots of work to do. Um, one final question. One final question. Oh, okay. I'll to, to, just to conclude, two more. That's it. I'm conscious I'm, I'm between you and your lunch. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Alice from Ital Preziosi. Uh, I have a concrete question which is very related to SBTI and SBTN. As we are on our final journey with SBTI, and as businesses usually need to be efficient also when they do strategies and trying to interconnect what is it possible. Do you think 
and this is our what we are inspiring, like aspiring, sorry, what we are trying to achieve, would be also to integrate SBTN together with SBTI because there are many solutions linked to climate that could be actually intertwining nature. So it would be amazing, is, I mean, and first of all, that SBTI and SBTN talk more so that we can be more efficient instead of repeating the same strategy and be more efficient and be more holistic because usually when, even with SDG, our approach is to treat them holistically. The more you can integrate, the better it is. So as a business, I wanted to ask to you as business, but also experts, what are your thoughts about SBTI and SBTN uh, integration? Thank you, Alice, for the question. And um, I can tell you that we have our biodiversity specialist working so hard on the SBTN because uh, you're raising the bar going for SBTN. So it's definitely something that has to be taken in consideration that could improve the quality of your business, especially in your industry. But um, I truly believe that uh, it's important to go step by step because uh, it's a a fascinating, wonderful journey, but it's also complex. So my advice is, let's start with what you're doing. And once completed, go for the other. Because uh, I can tell you that our specialist is really one of the best, and it's investing a lot of time, because it's complicated. And, and also learning, since Karen is doing the pilot on SBTN, it will help us to look at what we are developing, and I know Liesel and uh, uh, Madeleine, that, that what, that's what we've been asking also as an initiative. Anything that we're doing should be aligned with what is best practice worldwide. It's also, I see John Mulligan nodding, you know, he's also a champion on climate and helping us advance. I think we should not reinvent the wheel, we should really think, and also as an industry, maybe that's one message I wanted to say, we always want to reinvent our own wheel. Why can't we just work together for once, really united? Uh, and, and think about it together as a collective, you know, to push this climate uh, and nature agenda. I think I, uh, I'm almost overstepping time, so um, one more final question to the lady in red. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa Koenigsberg. And I wanted to go back to the very beginning of the panel when there was um, a discussion about terminology. And there was a separation of the idea of uh, biodiversity from the notion of sustainability. And I um, wanted to ask if perhaps this isn't an instance where we are frozen in our own time in the sense that sustainability encompasses all of this. Sustain what we've done is we've created a definition. We, we take a word, we create a definition of it that excludes actually something that's critical to it. And, um, you know, uh, this is very much part of what should be at the core of the discussion of sustainability with the true meaning of the word. So, um, thank you for this, and please, um, I, again, you know, I would say look across the boundaries of, you know, what people put up, because it's really, it seems to me, I hope you agree, deeply critical issue. Thank you very much. I think you could have not concluded better. Um, and I think that's also why when Karen Cartier founded it, when uh, Cyril Vigneron and Marie-Claire Daveu and Francois Palu at that time sat together, it was very obvious that that would be the interconnectivity, going deeper into climate, getting all the suppliers on board, going deeper into nature and biodiversity, going deeper into inclusiveness with a focus op on operationalization of human rights, vulnerable communities, artisanal scale mining, and DNI. Because the deeper we go, the more we will understand our value chain and the more we can share across. So we welcome you to, you know, for questions later. We're here till Monday. Uh, happy to have off-site conversations. Again, thank you for your time and uh, wishing you is still a very successful uh, con conference and fair the coming days. Thank you. Um, thank you.
so it seems to be my job to kind of be a bit like, oh, cutting across things. So I want to remind you that there's one more session. And it, unfortunately, I'm reminding you about a session that I happen to be helming. But I'm the re we are the real barrier between you and lunch. Oh, oh. And we very much hope you'll stay, because it's about um, intellectual property, um, climate and greenwashing, and social media. <laughs>